So actually, this is really great that I have your attention because today we have an info session right after this class. And it's over in the student center. And if you um, scan the QR code, that will take you to our card, which allows you to go ahead and um, go to campus groups and register. So it's awesome that you are all here together. You're getting started in research. If you look down the road, you are looking at what am I going to do with this? This research is allowing you to really make advances in your academic career, which makes you a perfect candidate for some of these prestigious awards. So I would love to see you at our event. Um, it starts at five with a little reception and you have an opportunity to meet your fellow ant eater prestigious scholarship recipients who all work through SOP to get these awards. So it can be scary, it can be intimidating, but that's what we're here for. We're here to walk you through it, guide you, demystify, and just make incremental progress to the point where, you know, what you started with at the start looks vastly different, and you're gonna be able to talk with each one of these students. Some of these are just three years out from where you guys are at, they're seniors. They receive grant, for instance, the Goldwater, the premier STEM research award. You can begin applying for it in your sophomore year, as well as your junior year, for your undergraduate study. Or you can talk to Joshua Wen. He's a senior, just three years out from where you guys are. He came to our office. He applied. He got the Fulbright Killam and studied in um, Canada. He just got back in December, and he also received the Strauss, which is a service and leadership award, very prestigious, just for certain California schools. But you can see we've got two National Science Foundation graduate research fellowship recipients, um, a California Capital Fellows finalist, and a, another Donald Strauss uh, semifinalist. So they're here to talk with you, answer your questions. We're only going to be there for a few minutes to kind of give you an overview of what SOP does, but they're going to be able to talk with you and, and, and literally encourage you to begin thinking about how our office can be literally just a few um, next, the next step in your, in your journey, okay? And as um, Dr. Klein mentioned, uh, you have your off and just down the hallway on the drum, that's where SOP is located. Okay, so I hope to see you all there and really encourage you to, to, to come. We've got a nice little reception. You'll have a chance to hear all of their stories, their journeys, and um, hopefully they'll inspire and encourage and motivate you. Free food and free money. Free food and free good. money. <laughs> so these scholarships are great not only because it's free money for you guys but it's also super prestigious if you guys are interested in going to grad schools like I sit on a lot of applications for grad schools on committees and we look for things like that it shows that you have initiative it shows that you've been successful in applying for things so I highly highly encourage you guys to apply there's a great team over at SOP that will help you go through the entire process. You won't be doing it by yourselves. And we have one of the best records of getting Fulbright scholars of any, any um, campus in the country. So we're one of the top producing number of Fulbright um, scholarships, which is like super prestigious. That's right, that's right. So hope to see you after this class. Uh, Shuff on over to the Student Center and um, mingle with, with these amazing students who are literally just a few years out from where you guys were. And even if you guys don't think that you're prepared to apply this year, definitely go find out what it's all about and then keep in touch with the SOP office because as you start getting into research, as you start getting your GPAs higher up, if you start doing more and more things, you become more and more competitive. So you can be applying for all these things all the way up until you graduate. In yeah. fact, past graduation. Exactly. And probably 201, every single um, SOP candidate was like, I didn't think I was... I was ready or qualified. Do not self-select. You are qualified through these types of programs, through the research that you do, through the relationships, through your different involvements, okay? Let the scholarship committees do the selection and ant eaters do really well in these competitions. So don't select yourself out.
Cool. Thanks, Rose. All right. All right. All right. Sharon, did you have any announcements or did you? All right, I'm going to share my slides then. We're going to get started talking about how to succeed in research. And today's topic is how to choose your research topic. Um, all right, so who here already has a research topic, is working in a lab? Has anybody matched since we first started talking? Almost? Was it, you're in a lab, you're start talking to a lab? Oh, very nice. OK, cool. How about anybody else? OK, so I thought that maybe the easiest way to start talking about this topic is um, to share a little bit of my story and how I've come up with my research topics over the years and how I first got into research. And please, um, this is highly interactive. Ask as many questions as you can as we go along through this. And then I have some resources for you guys to um, and th there was also on Canvas um, some resources in terms of how to do the mind map, how to find resources to think about your topic. Um, but a little bit about how I got started in research. So uh, as I mentioned, when I started at Cal as a transfer student, the first friend I made in mechanical engineering, there was like four or five women in the class out of a class of 50. Um, one of the women I became fast friends with, we would study together, and she told me that she was working in a lab. She was like, it's really cool. You should come check it out. So I went to the lab thinking, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I was definitely expecting a very formal, scientific kind of environment. And I walk in, and there's this super friendly third degree black belt, right? And he welcomes me, and he's, he's, awesome and he is like really into martial arts it's all he can talk about i'm just like <laughs> clearly not expecting this i was expecting like a serious scientist and he's telling me about martial arts and stuff and he's like you know come like investigate i really really want to understand the impact response of the human torso to taekwondo kicks because he's really into taekwondo and so he said you can make this your research topic so we made it my undergraduate research topic we got your op money for it and i started working in the lab and it was really fun not only because he got me into doing taekwondo um for a while but um also because it was this really cool experience and it actually is very relevant to the work that i do now so i make sensors now but back then was my first foray into actually making sensors we created this dummy we named him fred we stuck him inside a batting cage and i created a pneumatic foot that i shot through an ear cannon <laughs> at fred who hung in this chamber and we had all these sensors on him and we monitored its response to simulated Taekwondo kicks. So it was a really, really fun project. I didn't really know what to expect, but it was very interdisciplinary. I really enjoyed working with the grad students who were working in the lab and it felt very much like a home environment. He would invite us over to his house for barbecue with his family and kids. And it was a nice home away from home. And it really got me like interested in this environment because when I first went to Cal, I felt like I didn't really have friends, I didn't really know people, and here was this very welcoming environment where I could go and I had a place to put my backpack between classes, I had my own desk, I could sit there and do my, my work, and I always had people to talk to, and I ended up having these mentors, these grad students who served as my mentors throughout college. They would tell me what classes to take, what classes to avoid, so I really, really enjoyed that experience. And I thought, so I was a mechanical engineering major who was um, uh, pre-med as well. And I always thought that I was going to go on to medical school because that's what my parents had expected of me. But I kept trying different things because I wanted to explore what it was like to be in college and to do different things. And so one of the things that my department had was um, a human-powered vehicle. So... A human-powered vehicle sounds as ridiculous as it looks. It is this fully fared <laughs> bike, right? So this one's a single bike. I couldn't find pictures from when we did it. It was fully fared tandem. So there was two people riding. It was on two wheels. Now they've actually put made four wheels out of it. So you can imagine it's a lot easier to balance than when I rode it. And they really was excited about me joining the team because they wanted to be able to do... Um, 
world speed records and they didn't have any women on a team so they couldn't do women's speed records and i was into biking at the time so i was like oh this would be really fun so i joined the team and i got to experience what it was like to be on this team where we made this bike it was carbon fiber layup so we made the bike we would like create the shell then we would go out and try to race this thing but you can imagine this thing is very very hard to balance right so you need people running alongside of you to hold you up until you finally have enough balance and then you start pedaling and then you try to get a world speed record we ended up getting like four world speed records i got one world speed record we closed down a part of the freeway but like out in the desert for a whole weekend and we just did like time trials because you couldn't have any wind you couldn't have any slope um but it was just this really incredible experience and it made me really fall in love with engineering because before engineering was this thing where i just did problem sets in the textbook but here was this team of people doing this like really fun crazy you know, activities that was completely outside of the lab. And it turned out that my, my world speed record was the thing of conversation when you go to do interviews, even when I was getting my faculty jobs. The thing on my CV that everyone always asked about was my world speed record. So it just was a nice conversation starter. So I really high, highly recommend putting down, like getting something on your record that sets you apart from, from other people, right? Like everyone else is gonna have like basic generic things, but if you have something ridiculous, like, you know, a world speed record for a human powered vehicle, people are gonna ask questions about it. It. Anyways, um, so it just basically, I wasn't, there was no like directionality as to where I was going. I was just exploring different things. And it turns out all of these things, when you look back in life, things are all like kind of interconnected and you don't see how they're going to be connected. But going forward, you can see how these different experiences affects who you are and how you develop as a researcher, as the way you think. Um, but they're just fun experiences. So I encourage you guys to explore different things that you can do. My whole motto when I was in my early 20s and even late 20s was to just not say no to things. So if there were opportunities that presented themselves, I went for it. Then I discovered that I should say no to some opportunities. So then I decided I was gonna stay for grad school. I ended up staying in that same lab for my master's, um, which I really enjoyed. And I kept thinking I was gonna go to medical school, but, um, I really am a germaphobe and I really don't like getting close to people. I don't like touching people. And so I quickly realized that medicine was not a good <laughs> choice for me. You know, I like had all my prereqs, you know, done at this time. And I was thinking, okay, now to, now's the time to apply for, for medical school. And I just knew that I would not enjoy being a doctor. Um, so my friend, the one who invited me into her lab originally said, why don't you stay for your PhD? I'm going to stay for my PhD. So I started thinking about staying and I started like looking at different labs and I started talking to some professors and I was encouraged to stay. Um, and there was an opportunity. I started working in this lab. I was very interested. I took a class in microelectromechanical systems and um, applied for biological applications. It was actually the first of its course in the country. And it was a really, really cool area where you basically made these miniaturized sensors. And I thought, well, how cool. I'd love to like, you know, do some research in this area. And so I was invited by a very persistent professor to join his lab. Um, in neuroscience, it was a neuroscience, neurovision lab, actually, um, but they did work on cats. So they would stick probes into the cat's brains and they would do recordings and all night recordings, right? Like, so you'd have to be in lab from like 10 o'clock at night until eight o'clock in the morning, sitting with this anesthetized cat with its brain open. And I love animals. I love animals. I went to these these surgeries, I went through surgery, and then I discovered that I just couldn't stomach it. I couldn't stand it. I, every time I met a cat, I felt like the cat was judging me. It kind of knew <laughs> I was doing this, and I just, I couldn't do it. Like, it just turned my stomach. Um, so, and the professor was kind of creepy, and I knew I did not want to be, ever be stuck in a lab with him <laughs> late at night, and so um, there was a postdoc I really liked, and when he, um, was let go from the lab, I decided uh, this, I have to get out of this lab. I cannot do this research. I cannot ever stick something into a cat's brain. And so I ended up moving into the lab where I was making sensors. So I was making the sensors in one lab and bringing it over to the center lab, thinking I was going to eventually put it into the cat's brains. 
And I decided, I went back to that professor and I said, listen, I really, I can't be in that lab. And he said, I completely understand. I get that. You can just come and work in my lab full time. And so I finished my PhD with him. I ended up developing a platform to, um, to manipulate cells. So we were just using cell lines, no animals. Um, I had, there was actually a professor I really, really liked. And his research was amazing. He was actually developing therapeutics for cancer. So he was like, you know, and his results looked really, really promising but it was in a dog model. And I was like, I'm the biggest dog person. So I was like, there's no way. I went to his lab, he's like, and he really wanted me to join his lab. And I interviewed with him. He's like, you gotta join my lab. He was well-funded. And then he showed me the dogs. And I was like, there's no way I can do this. So you have to know yourself. You have to know what are the things that drive you, but also the things that like just are no-goes for you, right? And figuring that out is part of scoping out what you wanna do. So, um, so I ended up finishing the lab in this lab where we made these, these chips, these microchips to perform assays on cells. And then I graduated. We started a company based on my, my, my dissertation work. And then um, I got this opportunity to be a founding professor at the brand new University of California Merced campus. It was straight out of grad school. So I didn't do a postdoc. I was like, you know, in my 20s, and it was like really exciting getting to be, you know, a professor at a brand new campus. Everyone said this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it was because you would never want to do this twice. Um, so this is what the campus looked like when I got there. They were literally cows. Uh, there was no lab, there was no clean room where I was used to making my chips. It was nothing <laughs> to actually make anything with. We had to wear a hard hat to get onto campus. So I said, okay, well, how do you, and I was hired to make these chips to be able to make all of these diagnostic tools, right? So I'm like, well, how am I supposed to do my research now? And so I ended up um, tinkering as I like to do, and I was, um, I had this idea. I said, well, what if I could make these little microchips without using any of the clean room equipment that I'm used to using? And so I thought back to my favorite children's toy. And um, you guys, anybody familiar with this toy? No, it's called Shrinky Dinks. It was popular in the, in the early 80s. And the idea <laughs> was that you draw on it, it's very big, you draw on it, right? It's a piece of plastic, and you stick it in the oven for a couple of minutes and it shrinks down to a fraction of size. So what I needed to do was I needed to make microchips. So they had to be small, and they had to be able to fit individual cells into them, right? So they had to be very, very small, tall channels. And so if you just print on you know, you just stick something through the printer, your ink is not gonna be thick enough to make relief structures to be able to mold any sort of channels with the lines that you make, right? So you needed it to be thicker. So I figured if I printed it on the shrinky dinks, when it shrinks, it gets deeper, right? If it shrinks by X in each direction, it gets taller by X squared. So I thought, well, and then it gets smaller too, right? So you can get the microfluidics that I was trying to create. And so I was very excited. I had no grad students in my lab at the time because it was very difficult to recruit grad students. So I went into the lab, I was all excited. I told my undergrad in the lab, he's like, we can't publish that, people are gonna laugh at us. I said, people may laugh at us, but I'm desperate and we're gonna publish it anyway. And we ended up, it blew up the internet. So <laughs> we published it in the leading journal in our field, um, Royal Society of Chemistry. I said, I'm gonna submit it to like big journal. And we called it Shrinky Dink Microfluidics. And we ended up getting so much press around it. The CEO of Shrinky Dinks called my editor asking why these labs around the world were buying boxes and boxes of Shrinky Dinks. Because I had stumbled upon an unmet need, right? So. I had this need because I was suddenly in this environment where I wasn't used to the nice clean rooms that they had at Berkeley or in Irvine out in this, this you know, uh, new school. But there were lots of researchers all over the world who didn't have access to these clean rooms. And they were very excited about it. In fact, a lot of um, the labs, you know, like classroom labs, still use shrinky dink microfluidics. So Stanford still uses it in their course. Um, so we ended up getting a, a lot of press around this, which was really nice. Um, but I started seeing what else I could make with the shrinky dinks over the years. And it was just a cool experience because, you know, you think that research is going to be 
dry and you know um you know you're certainly not going to be going to parties and meeting interesting people and i did i you know i went to this big party that google held and i met this guy named david eagleman who was a professor at the time at stanford and he decided a few years later after meeting him at a party that he wanted to put together a documentary about creative people and so he got this producer to produce it and a film crew and a film crew reached out to me and they said we want to feature you in this documentary so the documentary was on netflix for a while so it really opened the door but that's the point of research right like you don't know where it's going to go and you can basically pick any research topic david eagleman was very interested in trying to understand what makes people creative right so he not only interviewed me but he interviewed like architects musicians um all different types of people from all different walks of life to figure out well, what is that what is it that makes people creative before that i remember talking to him at a party um and he was very interested in understanding perceived time dilation so apparently when you jump off a building and you think you're gonna die apparently time slows down and he tried this he actually created experiments to test to see if people actually perceived time slowing down or not when they were thrown off a building. So this was his research. You can look it up. It's got very fascinating research topics. So research projects can come from all over the place, right? So inspiration. But for me as an engineer, research topics come from a place of identifying an unmet need. And so I teach a whole class around being able to identify unmet clinical needs and applying engineering principles to being able to address those needs. So if you're interested in a research topic, look first where you have a personal problem, I would say. And so for the longest time, you know, I came to Irvine after I started getting all of this press and life was good. I published a lot. We were making diagnostic chips. We were doing quite a bit in the space. I was getting research grants. Things were great. And then my son Max was born in 2018 with a collapsed lung. So um, as my second baby, the nurse hands him to me and I knew something was not right. So he was kind of blue, very sleepy, very quiet. And my first child was not anything but quiet. <laughs> so like, what's wrong with this baby? He's like, oh, he's just like that. And my, my husband's like, you're all drugged up. You're hysterical. There's nothing wrong with him. He's fine. Nobody would listen to me for like hours. Nobody would listen to me. Finally, like I like flagged down a, an older, more experienced nurse. And she's like, okay. And I don't know if part of it was just to appease me. She's like, let me check. She put a pulse, pulse ox on him and she rushed him to the NICU immediately. She didn't even like stop to talk to me. She's like, we have to get him to the, to the NICU. His, his blood oxygen level is so low. So he had been out for several hours with a collapsed lung and nobody, nobody diagnosed it. He went in, stuck him in a little incubator box for seven days. They told me when his lung healed that I could carry him again. So we stared at this little box and all of his monitors for seven days. We said, okay, finally, you know, can we carry him? They're like, well, we don't actually know if his lung is healed or not. <laughs> Why are we sitting here? What are you talking about? And they said, well, there's no way to actually monitor respiration. So, this is 2018, one of the best hospitals in the country, in the world, and you're telling me there's nothing that can monitor something as fundamental as respiration. They said, yes, that is correct. So I thought that this was absolutely ridiculous. When my son healed, took him home, came back to work, I went to um, a pediatric pulmonologist here on campus. I said, is it really true that you can't monitor respiration? And he said, you know, you can monitor respiration rate, your Apple watch can do that, but you can't monitor respiration depth of breathing or volume, right? So to do that, you need to put on like a mask and then they actually measure how much you're exhaling, but there's nothing to do this continuously. So, well, that's ridiculous. So we published, <laughs> we decided we were gonna take these little sensors in my lab and we were gonna repurpose them to be respiration sensors. And we published it in Nature Digital Medicine and we ended up producing um, the sensor. Um, and my son Max is five and he's great now. He's um, completely healed. But the idea behind us is that we took the shrinky dinks, right? So I told you when you put ink on it, it shrinks. What happens if you put something that is, is um, stiff on it? If you put a very thin layer, so we're talking nanometric layers of metal on it, the metal can't shrink, right? So it buckles. So if you 
buckle, right? You have this like crumpled up piece of metal. When you stretch it back out, right? It's like an accordion. It can stretch back and forth. Uh, oh, I don't have the video. I not have the video. I have this great little video of, of showing the, the electrical signal as you stretch it back and forth. And so we put the metal, so we took it off the shrinky dinks, we put it into a soft material, and we put it on like a band-aid. The, um, the PhD student who worked on this project for his PhD um, now runs, the, he's the chief technology officer for the startup company that we started around this idea. Um, the company is called Makani Science, and now they're working with Chalk Hospital to get these sensors into the, the NICU um, for premature babies. All right, anybody have any questions? I've been talking for a while. Anyone? All right, so this got me into this whole realm of digital health, digital medicine, um, and it just, it just drove me nuts, right? That the average new car, right? Who here drives? Okay. Does anybody know how to park without cameras? A few people. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. I used to could do it, but now I'm so reliant on the cameras, right? The average new car has between 60 to 100 sensors, right? The average new person has zero sensors. I think that's kind of ridiculous. To take this analogy a little further, you own your average car in the US for six years, you own your bodies on average for 79 years. Coincidentally, you drive approximately the same number of miles as you walk in your lifetime, 110,000 miles. Yeah. Right. What is astounding is the number of breaths that you take, and more interestingly even than that, is the number of heartbeats that you, take, you have in a lifetime. Right? And so the average new car will transmit about 380 to 5,000 terabytes of data per year, while we are not transmitting any data about our own health, right? And if you miss, you know, a breath or two or a heartbeat or two, it's, it's game over. There is no tow truck that you're calling. So we said, well, what if we can develop and design these sensors to do continuous physiological monitoring? So we're not the only group in the country that does this. There's several labs. We actually published this review paper with a bunch of um, big labs in, in, the, in the country working on different types of sensors. Our sensors are mechanical sensors. These are the ones that we've been really concentrating on over the last few years. Um, and so the heartbeat thing was, was interesting to me, right? Um, how can we, our hearts beat constantly without us thinking about it? But if you miss a couple of those beats, it's completely game over. And right now, the way we think about monitoring your heart, right? What do you do when you go to the doctor's office? Or to CVS, what do you get? Anyone? Blood pressure, Blood pressure cuff, right? And it gives you, what does it give you? What information does it give you? Heart rate, so heart rate you can get from your, your phone too. Heart rate's kind of easy to, to measure, right? Heart rate, and it gives you blood pressure. So blood pressure, it gives you a systolic value and a diastolic value, right? American Heart Association says if you're, if you're a systolic, the upper number is above 140, you're hypertensive, that's dangerous, that's bad, right? <laughs> a cutoff value, it doesn't matter your demographic, it doesn't matter anything else about you, 140 is bad, <laughs> right? Based on historical data. Right, but this is really what your heart, your blood pressure actually looks like in real life. This is like watching this basketball game. Giannis is shooting in the finals of a playoff, and he is doing a free throw. All right, is he going to get it in? This is yes. Should right? He's MVP that year. He should get it in. Complete air ball. Right. So what your blood pressure actually looks like, you can't tell the next beat just because you knew the previous beat. The arm cuff measurements invented in 1881 looks fundamentally the same as the blood pressure cuff measurements that you take at the doctor's right now. Right. You can get continuous blood pressure measurements. This is in the form of an arterial line. Um, the sickest in the hospitals get arterial lines, so about 20% of... Um, 
ICU or operating room patients actually get a catheter inserted into them to get um, an invasive arterial line. There are non-invasive approaches. Edwards Life Sciences produced this one. It's about $50,000 though. And the, the um, disposable cuff is about $800. It keeps reinflating every 70 seconds. So every 70 beats of your heart. And so it's very uncomfortable. Your finger actually turns bluish um, if you try to leave it on. And so we thought, well, what if we could make a little soft sensor that can monitor blood pressure? And so we created, very similar to the respiration sensor that we made out of the children's toy, we created a blood pressure sensor that we can put on wherever you can feel a pulse. We calibrated it to an arm cuff. We published on it. We actually compared it to this $50,000 piece of equipment that I got on loan from Edwards Life Sciences and showed that it outperformed the really expensive device. Edwards Life Sciences took their device back. Um, but we published showing that our sensor outperformed theirs, and we started a company around it called Vena Vitals. And about 14 of my former students, we have about 14 employees there um, now, but a, a bunch of my former students all work at the company now. Um, and then more recently, just a couple of fun other projects, and we can open this up to getting your questions. Um, but where to go from there, right? So. As I became a mom, I started learning more about maternal issues and health inequities, particularly amongst women who are pregnant, right? So huge, huge health disparities. Um, who's, who's heard of Serena Williams? Does anybody remember what happened after she gave birth and she almost died? <laughs> so women with dark skin, right? Pulse oximeters are known to be very, very bad for people with dark skin, right? And so, there is no good way to actually measure if moms are going to bleed out after she gives birth. And so we decided we were going to combine our blood pressure sensor with some sensor technology over at the Beckman Lace Institute, but our choice sensor, we called it MOMS, um, Maternal Obstetrics Monitoring System. We ended up winning, uh, we came in second place, we got like $300,000 um, prize to develop out this sensor. I had a bunch of undergraduates actually work on developing out this form factor where we actually integrated both sensors into a shoe format so that pregnant women or women right after they give birth can wear them this, the shoe every day so we can actually get more continuous information about her from the comfort of her own home. Um, some other fun projects. We started working with electrical engineering labs, seeing if we could repurpose other fun things. So we ended up making um, skin compatible uh, conductive inks with Elmer's glue. Um, we published that paper, and I had a, and then we started working some more together, and we realized that there was no good way to actually um, do transmission underwater. So if you ever try to you know, send a signal through Bluetooth or wireless, underwater does not work, right? You lose the signal completely. And so we created these little resonator antennas that we pasted all over my student. He went swimming, we could monitor his, mo his movement underwater, battery free, right? So this was battery free, we just used resonators, we, we used these little antennas, and we can create what's called a body area network. So um, we published this in a super prestigious um, journal last year, but it really was a fun, it, I mean, it really started out with a very fun topic of what can we paint onto our skins to actually be able to monitor um, ourselves more continuously. So I think if I were to summarize kind of the, kind of how I stumble upon research topics, I try to start big, right? It's a funnel. You try to get as much information as possible in a funnel system. So if you're interested in a, in a topic, like say you're interested in maternal health, right? It's a relatively big topic. You start talking to people. I love to talk to clinicians and to nurses. You talk to folks, you read some research papers. Um, this is a great, um, we can share my slides and we can share this link with you. Um, she's, um, She's a cancer researcher, and she does all these YouTube videos on how to get into research and kind of walks you through and how to stay sane during research. Um, so this one is on how to choose a research topic. 
Um, so she kind of like walks you through how to do that, but she really recommends starting with reading review papers, which I think is a great way to go also, because then you can kind of get a broad sense of all the, what other people are doing. And then they usually have in the discussion section things that are still unanswered, right? Like questions that are not answered yet in this field where everybody's working on. Because in research, it's all about laying bricks on top of what other people have done, right? You're gonna contribute your piece of knowledge, you're gonna build upon what other people have done. So it's really, really important, it's critically important to understand what other people have done in this field first. So reading papers, right? You could do a Google search, you could do, um, yeah, so I would just, I mean, the first thing I would do is just to do a Google search and then figure out in this broad area and then you start finding, oh, well, I like this project, I like this topic, this looks like a fun paper, and then see, well, where do I go from there? And if you go to a professor and you've read some of their papers and you can talk about the paper that you've read of theirs, like that really opens doors for you. Like we're, you know, we're humans. We're flattered when somebody reads our paper. <laughs> and if you can talk about that and you can talk about it in a semi-educated way and you can talk about, well, this is what I would do after that or why did you do this? I didn't really understand this part. They love to expound on things that they've been thinking about for the last year of their life. And so that's a great way to get your foot in the door into a research lab. Um, so I'm gonna stop there for a bit and see if there are any questions. I'll stop sharing my slides so I can see what time it is. Anything? I think you get passionate about things that you really care about. And so for me, when I get fixated on a problem that I really want to solve, like <laughs> this not being able to monitor whether my son was breathing or not, like that really bugged me and I couldn't stop thinking about it. The last time I had felt that that level of like dedication to trying to solve a problem was when I was stuck in Merced trying to figure out how to do microfabrication without a clean room. So I think having those inspirations, like those unmet needs, is really, um, can be very, very inspiring. So I think it may be a little different than if you just happen to go into a lab and you're assigned a research topic, but I think you can make those research topics your own and you can seek out those projects that align well. I know, you know, a bunch of entrepreneurs and some of the best medical devices come from them addressing their own unmet clinical needs. Um, the uh, partner at Y Combinator, who is my partner when my company went through it, Servisana, she started a company in her late 20s based on a medical problem that she had growing up and she ended up selling her company for like $280 million. Right? She's very dedicated to being able to solve that problem. She knew a lot about it because she had this domain expertise that, you know, because she's lived with this medical problem. So I think that that's a great angle to get into research is to think about it. It doesn't have to be medical by any means, right? It could be um, social injustice, it could be health inequities, it could be, you know, uh, dyslexia, it could be anything that you are very interested in, I think is a great launching point for figuring out, well, how do I turn this into a research topic? Do you have like any skills to go into that? Like, that'd be like required. Like, because I feel like I don't like have like I don't know like what I would need to do that research. Like, would I need to learn like certain programs and stuff like that? Like, I guess like did they ask you anything like that, or the questions weren't really taught you? Um. So, you know, and I think um, Professor Dong had mentioned this. You know, I think. When you're going into a lab as a grad student, you do expect them to have quite a bit of like skills. As an undergrad, you know, especially if you're coming in your freshman or your sophomore year, 
professors don't expect it. My professor certainly didn't expect it. I had to learn CAD. I had to learn how to do different things. I had to learn how to machine, but there were folks in the lab who taught me how to do everything. And so that's the way I approach undergraduate researchers as well. If they come in, some of them come in with programming skills or something that they picked up in, when they were in high school or on a side project, and that's great, but we certainly don't expect it. I think what I expect is somebody who is a go-getter, who is uh, mature and responsible and who takes it seriously and really wants to be there. I think that is really the driving factor of getting into um, a research lab. Yes. Would you say you're much more patient and lenient to your undergrads than your graduate students? I think my grad students would definitely say that, yes. Because yeah. <laughs> I think you expect when they have had certain experiences and, you know, like, and, and there is a requirement. Like, I do require that the grad students have to publish three first author papers to graduate from my lab. And so if they're not making progress, it, like, becomes a stressor, right? But for the undergraduates, like, they get, they take... Europe, they, you know, so they get Europe money for it, they get 199 credit, they help out the grad students, so as long as, like, you know, I'm not actively losing money on them because they're breaking everything in lab, like, I don't, <laughs> I, I chalked it up to, you know, this is a learning experience for them, and they're, they're getting something out of it, you know, certainly if they come in, and they're bringing in their friends in, and they're disrupting the lab, and, and I've had this before, they're, like, use it as a place to hang out with all their friends, and they're breaking equipment, and they're not cleaning up after themselves, then I would, like, that's, that's where I draw the line, but I don't expect that they're going to, you know, it's great, I've had, I've had undergrad students who have published papers, who have like done really remarkable things, but I don't expect it. Because I know you guys as, as undergraduate students also have a heavy load. You have to take a lot more classes than grad students do. Um, so I don't expect the, that level of productivity. Yes. Sometimes you get an exceptional one. You get one that just makes like teaching fun again, you know, like for me, the part that I like about research is coming up with an idea and going into lab and having somebody to talk about it with <laughs> and to be like, what do you think of this? And my husband like flat out tells me, he's like, you know, 90% of your ideas are terrible. And I want somebody to tell me it's terrible and to be able to tell me why it's terrible. Like I have very thick skin. It's totally cool to tell me that my idea sucks, but I want that conversation. I want to have that back and forth of, well, you know, and, and that's the thing, right? Like you just, generating ideas it's not it's like it's not life and death most of the time right you just come up with lots of ideas and some of them will stick and some of them won't and some of them will be really bad but if you have lots of ideas chances are one of them is going to be decent right and so for me personally i get the most joy when i am in lab and i have people who are equally excited as me but can also think critically and it doesn't have to be like you don't have to like no fancy equations and like just basic, you know, engineering principles, basic physics, right? Like you could shoot down the idea or tell me why it's not going to work or like I get excited about that because then I'm on to my next thing, right? Then I could know how to improve it. So I love having that dialogue, that feedback. So somebody that I can talk with and somebody who's excited to try um, because a lot of these things like you don't really know if so I can tell you about one of our, our newest projects that we're working on. Um, so hypertension, right? I mentioned like these hypertension spikes. So people get these large hypertensive spikes and people just usually take medication for them. Medication, it's not really great. Um, but people who have obstructive sleep apnea, so when they sleep, when they stop breathing, their blood pressure actually surges. It actually goes up by like 20, 50 millimeters of mercury within seconds and drops back down. And so if you're not taking continuous blood pressure measurements, you don't see those at all. But we put our sensors on these patients and you could see that their blood pressure is going nuts and it's correlated exactly with the sleep apnea events, right? So it's very correlated. And so my big dream was, I said, well, what if we could cancel out those there was like blood pressure surges. So I started talking with a sleep physician, um, Rami Kayad here, and he's like all excited about it. So we're starting a clinical study where we're actually putting them not just on a CPAP because the CPAP has been shown to not be effective in reducing the hypertension, but in um, putting them on medication to see if we can lower the blood pressure. But that doesn't like, that just didn't sit right with me either, right? So I wanted to see if we could actually create a closed loop system so that we can um, electrostimulate a nerve 
to reduce the blood pressure spikes to see if we can like cancel it out. And so there's a new neurologist that I'm working with and he like did his PhD in bioengineering. So he's also like a crazy scientist. And so we're like rigging up a system and we're like, you can't test this on people, right? Because it's like electrostimulation and we don't have an IRB yet. So we're testing on ourselves. And my students are there and they're like, well, you can test it. I'm like, no, we can't test on you. We can test on me. <laughs> so we go in like after hours and we like put all this stuff on us. And it's like the most fun. Like I love trying to see if an idea works or not. And just like those early stages. And that's what I love about the startups. Like I love like the early stages before like you formalize everything, just having that idea and seeing if it works or not. Just a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Is there a question back there? Um, so I highly recommend, there's a link, there's a video. She, oh, there's a question in the back over there, yeah. That's a great question. So how often do I jump from project to project? Um, so. At any given time in my lab, I have at least eight projects going. Um, so we have projects on monitoring. We, an ENT doctor came to us. He wanted to be able, so people who have had brain, they're like trauma to their brain, they um, sometimes would leak cerebral spinal fluid, but it looks like snot. And so apparently ENT doctors cannot tell the difference between snot and cerebral spinal fluid. You can imagine. That's kind of a big deal, right? So we are creating a point of care sensor for him to measure snot and so to measure the <laughs> drippings to see if it's snot or not. And so we're working with um, a chemistry lab. Um, we're creating aftermers that are specific to the protein that we're looking for in the CSF. But we have like all of these random projects. And a really good piece of advice I got when I was, I guess, probably your age was from a friend who said, you know, if you want to be happy in life, you need like this pie of life where you cannot put all of because I was a very kind of it was a very type A personality in school. And it was all about getting good grades and like being successful and thinking like I wanted to be a doctor and this is like what I needed to do. So I would fail a test and I would cry and I wouldn't know what to do. And she said, you need to have this balanced life where you have these different things going on in each one of your pies. So you gotta take a pie, sli pie and cut it up into at least eight slices. And so I've kind of projected that onto my research. And so it's just too much pressure for any given one project. If you have one project and it doesn't work, I feel like I would just be like obsessing over it and probably driving my grad student nuts. Um, but if you have like at least eight projects at any given time, chances are there's going to be at least one project that is doing okay at any given time. And so it's not so much pressure. And so I found that that has really kind of helped me in life. I like having different things that make me happy, that kind of fill up my pie chart. So as a general rule of research and a general rule of life, I would say diversify your portfolio and have more than one thing. <laughs> But I do jump, so that was my other point that I failed to convey. I do think as a researcher, you have this like idea of like in a Big Bang Theory or like these movies where just one person like researches this one thing for like 50 years. Like that's, that's not, <laughs> that's not what happens, right? You do, you're supposed to focus on one project and go deep for your PhD because you know, it's that whole 10,000 hour things, right? Like we want to see that you become an expert, a domain expert in one very specific thing so that you can be that leading expert in the world in this one very specific thing. But it doesn't mean that's the research that you do your whole life, right? It's, you have to be able to jump from topic to topic because I've seen researchers go absolutely obsolete because their research just completely dried up. <laughs> like, their research field went away. And if you don't know how to pivot and jump from research topic to research topic and use the same analytical skills that, you that you've developed um, doing your research to move into another field, like you're, you're not gonna be successful in research. You have to follow their funding. You know, you get funding from the government 
and they kind of indicate what they're going to fund and they fund different things from year to year. And if you want to be successful and you want to be able to be relevant in terms of going after important big problems, you need to be able to pivot. And so that I think is also a really important skill in research is to be able to move around from topic to topic. And so it's fun for me. Now I'm doing like a lot of AI. Now that we're getting sensor data from our sensors, now I'm learning AI and it feels like I'm getting a PhD all over again. Like it's, it's fun to be able to learn new things and to, that, for that to be your work. So that's, that's part of what I really love about research also. Cool. Any more questions? All right. Well, we are right at time then. All right. Thank you. <laughs>